me when I travel a bunch of places and camp out. They say, what are you going to eat? Ah, I've got a loaf of bread and peanut butter. I'm all right. <laughs> any rate, I want to talk to you about, uh, uh, oh, I need to make this announcement. The marriage seminar is this Friday and Saturday in Branson. So all of you that decided you were going to go to that, you made a wise choice. And uh, uh, we're going to go that. And we always have a great time with the marriage seminar. It's at, it's at Branson at the Woods, or, or is it called Westgate at the Woods, whatever it is. But uh, uh, we've been a timeshare holder down there for 20 years, and we never go down there. So We go to Branson. We stay in other hotels or Griggs's or something. But I want to tell you, uh, it is a nice place, and you're going to really enjoy it. So we're going to make our Bible confession. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I will do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. And my heart is receptive. I'm about to receive. The incorruptible, the incorruptible, the indestructible, the indestructible ever living seed, seed of the Word of God. I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. Never, never, never. never, never be the same. Never be the same. In, Jesus name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And our patch holder bike, uh, Bible study and potluck dinner will be after church today. Uh, I want to, I, I want to, I named this sermon today Rejoice because I want to talk to you about. The, Jesus said all things are possible uh, if we only believe. And uh, I want to straighten out something. It's not just believe that there is a God. But you know the Bible says that without faith it's impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. And what's the second thing? And he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so we are the people that diligently seek him. And and I want to tell you, uh, I want you to believe God even when it seems to your senses that things are not working, your answers are not. I have people come to me and say, man, I've been praying and praying and praying. God's not listening to me. And I always want to tell them, sure, he's listening to you. How could anybody miss, miss somebody that's nagging all the time? <laughs> but in reality, the truth about it is, uh, God said, call on me and I will answer. He always answers. And, uh, uh, but they come to me and it seems like nothing's happening. And you say, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, nothing seems to change. God must not hear my prayers. But this is when your faith has got to come into play. Uh, we are net, not led by what we see. We're led by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God. And so if, uh, if, you're, believe, if you're believing, let, let me give you for instance. You say, I believe because the Bible said if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord, I believe I'm saved. Uh, but if you start going, well, I don't feel saved. Does that mean you're no longer saved? No, it just means you don't feel saved. Sometimes we get done acting a certain way and say, how could I even know God after I did that? Don't you ever get that way? Say, Man, am I saved at all, God? Answer that way. Anyway, Hebrews 11, 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. And it, our faith is literally the evidence of things we cannot see. Your faith, somebody said, I need some evidence about what's going on. No, your faith is the evidence. Think about that for a while. Well, I believe it when I see it. Now, that's not faith. You've got to understand there will often be a period of time between the time you pray and the time the answer finally shows up for you. Why do I say that? Did that mean that God didn't answer? No, he answered. He answered the prayer. Matter of fact, Psalm 56, 9 says, The very day we call for help, the tide of the battle turns. But I remember when Daniel prayed, it was two weeks before uh, he saw the angel appear to, to minister to him. And the angel said, I'll tell you why it took so long, because uh, this is in today's vernacular. It took so long because I had to battle the prince of Persia, which was a, a demon spirit over that, over that area. I had to fight him before I get to you. Right now, your prayers, the minute you prayed, God answered the prayer. And right now, there are spiritual battles going on in the heavenlies you don't even know about. Because God's desire is to answer your prayer. Amen? Amen? It doesn't mean that God's not working in the supernatural. He's doing things in the spiritual realm that you can't even imagine. But he's doing it. Let me tell you. You ever notice that, that now we take a lot of pictures with our phones. But if you take a picture with a camera, 
uh, you'll notice that you, the minute you take that, snap that picture, that film is exposed. But until you take that film into a dark room and use the right camera, I don't know what it is, inside of a dark room, can you produce a picture? Then it produces a picture. But it has to go into the dark room. I'm trying to tell you that sometimes between the time that you pray and God answers that prayer, there are demon spirits trying to hold back that thing that you prayed for. And sometimes your faith isn't built till you go inside that dark room for a little bit. And when you're inside that dark room, man, that film is, exper uh, is exposed, and now the picture of what you prayed for becomes evident. Amen? Hebrews 12, 2 says, we, we do the, in the Living Translation, New Living Translation, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. I know some of you don't want to hear this, but sometimes you've got to spend a little time and with the trials and the tribulations and everything else. You've got to spend a little time in the dark room before that picture is developed inside of you. But that's the time that you need to stand in faith. I prayed and I didn't see it. God didn't hear it. No, God hears you. Call on me and I will answer. 1 Peter 1, 6-7 talks about the trial of your faith. This is in the Amplified. You should be exceedingly glad on this account. Though now for a little while, somebody say for a little while. <laughs> now for a little while you may be distressed by trials and suffer temptations. But it's so that the genuineness of your faith may be tested. Your faith, which is infinitely more precious than the perishable gold which is tested and purified by fire. This proving of your faith is intended to redound to your praise and honor and glory when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, is revealed. Yeah, I know you're going through. Well, I'm a believer. Well, so what? You're going to go through temptation, trial, test. And yet the Bible says when someone is tempted, do not say God tempted me because God is not tempted, neither tempts he any man. Your problem isn't with God. The devil knows what you desire. He's doing everything he can to keep you from getting it. Right. Now I'm going to say some things that, that you might not want to hear. But we stand in faith and we confess it and we believe it. And then it isn't here and then what do we say? Here are angels working on our behalf to bring about this thing. And, uh, and we're standing and believing and all of a sudden said, well I guess that God's not going to answer that prayer. And because angels hearken at the word of the Lord, we start operating in unbelief. And the Lord's attitude is, well, you've got to stop now because he quit believing. And the angels stopped in their track. Yeah, but we were going to take care of them. I know, but he don't believe. Why do you think, why do you think that Paul called this Christian life the fight of faith. It's a fight of faith. Because everything in this world and the enemy is doing and what this world is doing is trying to drive your faith down. Drive it down. But listen, you can't drive it down if you suddenly realize this very important thing. Your faith is not in your ability. Your faith is in God's ability and his desire to bless you. He wants to bless you. But you think if you cry and complain and get depressed and worry, maybe that will do it. No. I've heard people say, man, I've been crying day and night for this thing. Well, God has compassion on you. But there's a difference between moaning, murmuring, and complaining and standing in faith. Well, I've been crying a lot, and he understands your tears. God doesn't change his rules of operation for you. He has a way of operating, and he has to stand by those rules. So what is the solution? Well, number one, it's the word of God. 
I know you hear it from me all the time, but how can you confess what the Word of God says about your situation if you're never in the Word of God and you don't know what it says? You need to know what it says. What does it say about this? I mean, there are some simple things. You don't have to quote the scripture all the time, but you ought to know. If the devil comes along and says, God's not going to give it, you're bad. No, I'm good. I'm washed in the blood. Yes, that's right. I don't have to quote the scripture. I've read this Bible through so many times, I think I know by now God is good. Amen. Very simple thing. Devil bad, God good. Devil bad, God good. Good God. Devil's bad. Come on. So get inside the word. Number two, a real key to keeping my place in faith is praise and thanksgiving. Yeah. Oh, it's so hard to be in the middle of praise and in the middle of doubt. Man, when you get a praise on, you start praising God for who he is, it's hard to doubt the things of God, isn't it? In your dark time, you've got to continually speak forth the promises of God. You've got to continually praise and thank God and know that your answer is on the way. What did, what did he say in, in uh, Romans 4 about Abraham? Abraham did not waver, but he knew that what God has promised, he was also able to perform. Amen? We know promises of God, but when we get in a situation, we're kind of like Peter. Of course, I've not walked any on the water. I tried to work. But Peter had been under the anointing of God that told him to walk to him. And when he started walking, he got his eyes on, he started walking fine. But then he got his eyes on the storm and the waves and everything else. He started sinking. And I love this. God didn't say, well, that's it. You're drowning, boy. He reached down and picked him up. My Savior, my Deliverer. Yeah. Prayer. Prayer. Hey guys, don't have a conversation when I'm talking. Prayer is faith at work. Praise is faith at work. Say, praise God. Praise God. Oh, praise his, name. oh praise his name. God is good. God is good. I'm, praising I'm praising his name. Every good, Every good. and wonderful gift, wonderful gift. Comes, from comes from God. Praise his name. Praise his name. You can't have doubt and act like that. <laughs> praise is faith at work. When you praise God in your dark hour, it literally Drive that devil crazy. I remember Paul and Silas. They were locked up in prison. They were following God's direction. They didn't go into Asia like they're supposed to, but they went down. They, they led the seller of purple, Lydia, to the Lord. They cast a demon out. They were thrown inside a prison. They're in there. The, the, the prison started shaking. The doors opened, and, and they walked out. We used to sing a song that what, that what uh, uh, I can't remember, but it's like, he, he went like this, bleeding in the darkness, the cell was cold and mad, driven to unconsciousness by the stripes upon his back. He heard a voice call out his name. What did Paul and Silas do in the midst of that? Pray. But I We'll praise the Lord. Amen. I will praise the Lord. No matter what tomorrow brings, what it has in store, I know I will praise the Lord. When your darkest times. You know, listen to Paul. He said, five times I was given 39 lash lashes with a leaded whip for preaching the gospel. He said, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned for preaching the gospel. I like to joke, I've been stoned more than one time. Anyway, he said, I was shipwrecked. I was shipwrecked three times. 
And once I spent a night and day on the open sea, he went on to say, I've been tired, lonely, cold, I've been hungry, I've been thirsty, I've been in all kinds of incredible danger throughout my whole lifetime. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, he said, for all our light afflictions are but for a moment. What? Light afflictions? I know that God was pleased with it. And now the devil must have been going, what do you mean light afflictions? I've put everything on you I possibly can. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul had the audacity to call all he had been through light affliction? But you might call it light afflictions if you compared it to what Jesus went through on the way to the cross. Than what we suffer. Uh, he was probably thinking, let me tell you something. I'm going to write this down that there are only light afflictions for the people now and thousand years from now are going to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's absolutely nothing that you can do to me or anybody else that bears the name of Jesus to stop us from fulfilling God's purpose and destiny in our life. Amen. I'm going to get this written down. Everybody needs to know there's nothing you can throw at a Christian that's going to stop us from doing the things God called us to do. Amen. We've got to show the enemy who we are in Christ. No matter what's going on. Show him. Too often people give up too easily. In my mother's time, and if she's watching this, yes, Mom, I said, in your time, you're 90 years old. But anyway, in my mother's time, when somebody, when she was growing up, if somebody was a Christian, they called, they said that that person was part of the way. There used to be a Bible called the way. And I used to remember there was one gal just acting up and everything and not act like a Christian at all. I remember my mother said, you know, she needs to get out of the way. <laughs> And let somebody stand up and live for God. But she's always lived for God, been a real example to me. But too often people give up too easy. They, they kind of weaken. And the devil knows what did it takes to really get on your last nerve. You know the last nerve? You ever heard that before? I'm sure there were times your parents told you, you're getting on my last nerve. <laughs> Now, I, never, I know you've never told Brindley that she's getting on your last nerve because she, she walks in perfection. Sometimes things can happen, kind of take the wind, seems to take the winds out of your sail. It's like you say, use terms like, that's the straw that broke the camel's back. You feel like you can't go anymore. You've done everything you can. Right now, I'm going to tell you something that may come as a surprise to you, but in other people it won't be a surprise to you. What I'm preaching today is so important because I believe one of the greatest attacks upon the body of Christ right now is dissatisfaction. The devil works on getting you to murmur and complain because you're not satisfied. As if the whole thing in the universe is about satisfying you. But it, beyond all that, he works in that way. You murmur and complain. You can't stand the job you got. I thought it'd be better. Well, do they pay you? They give you a lunch break? Did they hold up their part of the bargain? You got a job? Be thankful for it. Some people get dissatisfied with their marriages. Because not everybody married a perfect man like my wife. No, I just. We were inside the bank one day, and they heard me bragging on Debbie. And, uh, and when she walked in behind me, she goes, Is this the woman you said is absolutely perfect and never makes any mistakes? Yes, this is my wife. And I introduced her. But listen, the point is. The devil's trying to get you dissatisfied with things in your life when you need to be thankful for what you have. Say, I need to be thankful. Amen. We need to greatly rejoice. 
that are moaning and complaining about, we need to greatly rejoice, as the Bible, as the Bible said, as Paul said. And the Amplified said, we need to be exceedingly glad. That's the reason we started out, and I'll do it quicker with this confession. This only weekend we're doing that confession. But I started out with, Father, I thank you that you are the great God that created this whole universe by your mighty word and power. There is no other God like you. You are my God, and in you I put my trust and confidence. You're my Savior, my Deliverer, my Redeemer, my Healer, my Helper. And Father, I just greatly rejoice because your word says, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. And Father, I thank you every tongue that raised against me in judgment, you'll condemn it. Father, I thank you that your word says you always cause me to triumph. And when my enemies come up against me like a flood, your spirit raises a barrier against them. And Father, I thank you that the Lord is my light, my salvation. I don't have anybody to be afraid of. Father, I greatly because because your word says in Psalm, you laugh at my enemies. And Father, today I join in that laughter. <laughs> I'm laughing at you, devil. Ain't nothing you can do to drive me down. You can't praise God like that and stay down and depressed. No way. Some people are very excited about the, the new truck they have, the new car they have, the new motorcycle, the new house. Get excited about belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's your Savior, Healer, Deliverer, and He watches out for you. Say the things you know that are powerful because there's life and death in the power of the tongue. We need to say those things. We need to keep praising. We need to know I can do all things through Jesus Christ which strengthens me. And if God before me, who can be against me? That, that's not bragging on you. That's bragging on God. If God before me, who can be against me? Everybody talks about the problems we have. Maybe we ought to be the ones to talk about the solution. Amen. 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 This is kind of a long story, and I hadn't read it in a long time. An illustration, I've you've heard it before, but it's my pulpit. You're going to hear it again. <laughs> it's a story told of a boy who found an eagle's egg in the forest floor. Unable to return the egg to its mother, he put it in the nest of a prairie chicken who accepted it as one of her own. Eventually, the eagle hatched from its shell and grew up in the community of little prairie chickens. All his life, the eagle believed he was just another chicken. And he sure looked different, walked different, sounded different, but that didn't matter. He knew he was a chicken, so all he did was what chickens do. Scavenge the dirt for insects and seeds, duck, clucked, and cackled, and twitched his large white head and hid from the predators above. On occasion, he'd flutter his wings and just hover a few feet above the ground. And several years went by among the chickens, and... One day, he saw this magnificent bird flying above him in the sky. With admiration, he watched as this beautiful creature seemed to hang among the clouds and gracefully majestic on the powerful currents of wind. What an extraordinary bird, he said to the others. What is it? He said, that's an eagle, the king of birds. But you can never be like him. You're a chicken. So he lived the rest of his life like a chicken and died a chicken. What a tragedy for the eagle. He was designed for greatness, built the soar to rule the heaven. But he never got off the ground. Instead, he spent his life scratching in the dust for bugs and kernels. It's the story of so many, not eagles, but people. God created you to do so much more with your life. He didn't create you to accomplish nothing with your life and going around pecking on the dirt. He expected you to soar yeah. like eagles. Yeah. And he created you to do that. And it's a shame when people settle for less. But if you can get in the Word to start believing God, yeah. oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together, the psalmist said. God wants us to be increasing. You can't accept the status quo. You got to stir yourselves up and believe God for bigger things. You got to be pressing forward all the time. Got to be reaching for higher heights and trying to do more for Christ. Yes. Totally and completely rely on the Holy Spirit to help us. You're not bragging on you, you're bragging on God. Yes. Amen? Amen. Sometimes people have been through so much that they want to judge 
from this point on by what they've already done or not done. Stop it. This is a new day. It's a new time. He knows what you need. He'll give us wisdom. He'll give us the money, the finances, the resources. He'll freely give us the know-how. He'll freely give us the strength to carry out his will. All God's looking for is people with a big vision. Do you have a big vision? God's looking for people to dream big dreams. I know I pastor a little church outside of Buckner, Missouri. But my dream, originally, I used to tell the Lord, if, if I could just win one person to Christ in my life, that would be good enough for me, God. But God had to change my thinking. And I said, Lord, you didn't come on this earth. You would have done it for one person, but you came in the earth that you weren't willing that anybody should perish. And God, I'm not going to be willing that anybody should perish either. So I'm going to impact as many people as I possibly can. If I could impact this many people, and you could impact that many people, and they impacted that many people, do you know how many people would be going to heaven? It's an exciting time to be alive. I challenge you to dream big dreams, stir up your faith, stretch out your faith, broaden your horizons, get rid of that limited thinking of the past. Just because the dream hasn't come true yet doesn't mean that God's not working in the background to accomplish all those things. Never give up on him. We may be natural, but we're also supernatural. And he's a supernatural God. In our time of need, we've got to do exactly what Peter said. Rejoice greatly. Hallelujah. Rejoice greatly. He didn't give up on me. I ain't going to give up on God. Amen. Devil's tried to kill me a few times. But I won't go till my race is run. My race isn't run. Amen. Amen. Man, do you rejoice in the little things in life? I've just found out what a wimp I am. You know how I found that out? I watch things like Somewhere in Time, all the romance shows. I watch figure skating with my wife, something's happened to me. <laughs> I am a romantic. And somebody said, were you always a romantic? Well, sort of. But when I met Jesus and I found out what real love was, all I wanted to do was plunge myself into the middle of it. Yes. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's stand to our feet. First of all, I want you to say this. Raise your hand. Say, Lord Jesus, my life is yours. You paid the debt for me. You paid for all my sins. You set me free from sin. I receive you as Lord and Savior. I receive you as Lord and Savior. You are my boss. You are my boss. And you're a better boss than I am. I thank you, Lord, for saving me. Now I'm going to live a life that honors you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to take communion. Hallelujah. Man, that's good preaching. I even think so. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we had Mr. Tallman here today. You can tell he's a real tall one in line right there. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. His mic on. healing, my children's healing. Thank you that by your stripes, by the beatings you bore, by the lashes which fell on your back, we are completely healed. I believe and I receive. Raise your cup. Thank you, Jesus, for the new covenant cut in your blood. Your blood has brought me forgiveness, washed me from every sin. I thank you that your blood has made me righteous. And as I drink, I celebrate and partake of the inheritance of the righteous, which is preservation, healing, wholeness, and prosperity. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, I just speak a blessing on everyone here. Business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. Pour out your blessings, your power, your spirit, your grace in such a mighty way that when the rest of the world sees them, they'll say, surely these people have been with Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for coming.